a geoholic. Small things. <laughs> I love this song. First time we've used Blink One Eighty Two. I can't believe that. I I did a search and everything through all the episodes. I'm like, surely we've used Blink One Eighty Two before, no? and uh, have not. So uh, it's it's nice. Good to get some Blink. Blink 182 yeah, yeah, on the show. Exactly. And on that note, I want to remind everybody that on Spotify, there's a Geoholic playlist. There is. Every song from every episode, all 200, well, almost 200 episodes. Almost 200. Uh, on the playlist, chronological order from episode one all the way through to tonight, which is episode 198. Episode 198. Yes. So on that note, we are going to hit episode 200, obviously not this year. It'll be the first part of next year, yeah, yeah which is fine. Like and yeah. we'll, we're going to do something. You know, we've got a, we've got a week hill, a week off next week. Yeah. And uh, I got a couple of things up my sleeve. Do you? Yeah. Well, some that I'll share with you and some that I won't. All right. Fair I'll just, enough. I'll just put it that way. I like it. I like it. And on that note, um, friends of the program updates. Oh man. We Good stuff. We have uh, pretty much everybody has renewed for next year, yeah. which is really, really exciting. We greatly appreciate that. Added a couple. Added a couple new ones. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple other oh, strategic partnerships in the works That's correct. that are pretty exciting as well. Uh, there's just some really cool things happening, shaping up for 2024. So can't wait to make those announcements right after the first of the year. Uh, it's going to be an exciting year. And we do. I mean, I guess technically we have a couple spots available. Um, yeah. So if somebody listening was interested in being a friend of the program. Absolutely reach out. Please do, and you can reach us at info at thegeoholics.com, of course. And then one more reminder. Okay. We have a Patreon, which we never promote, no, right? No, not really. And no. for as little as like $5 a month, you can be a patron, as they say, mm -hmm. of the Geoholics. And with that, for as little as $5 a month, Get we will a whole bunch send of swag. you all the swag that we have. Yes. One or everything. Sometimes two, yeah. and, depending on the day. And we're going on a uh, end of the year clear out. <laughs> <laughs> the clear and sale. Yeah, already done. Clear and sale. <laughs> we want to clear out the old stuff and get some, get some new get swag some new for stuff next year. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, other than that, how have you been? Uh, very good. Uh, we missed you last week. Just yeah, FYI. Yeah, sorry. Had some technical it's, challenges. You know, uh, you know, I noticed on the recording, but it's not yep. anything that we can't uh, can't piece back together. We're pros. Well, you're a pro. Um, I'm just an idiot. Noted. Um, <laughs> we uh, no, I had a, had a little, little little birthday outing that um, my wife and friends planned that I did not know, so I could not plan for. Then mm -hmm. I prevented mm -hmm. me from being here. But we uh, mentioned that uh, it, it was a lot of fun, and mm -hmm. uh, it was a, it was a good week. And now everything's just been super busy. <sighs> end like, of the year, right? It, well, not crazy. even normal. And this is like crazy end of the year. Mm. Like, wow. I swear, it was like one hint of. The interest rate might drop next year, and it's just construction crazy wow. again. So that's amazing. Um, yeah, you know, but uh, uh, things are get excited for the holidays. You cool. know, got the house decorated. Uh, nice. You know, got almost my Christmas shopping done. So, uh, what about you? Um, Christmas decorations. I told Megan that next year we're not even putting up a Christmas tree. <laughs> I mean, it's a three-day event. <laughs> And I'm like, it goes up. It takes three days to get this monster up. It yeah. looks absolutely beautiful when it's done. Yeah. And then like three weeks later, it takes five minutes to take it all down. Yeah. And then it's uh, just such and an then effort. Seven weeks of vacuuming needles because <laughs> they never seem to go away. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I know. I get it. I get and she's it. like, the only way I am not putting up a Christmas tree is if we go away. So I'm like, um, done. That's also been a thing. Like <laughs> some people, and I used to do it with my family for for their for really? a bit. Like we would just plan a trip mm -hmm. like instead of going through the whole thing if we're gonna have to travel yep let's just plan a trip and go somewhere fun and enjoy 100%. it there we, i mean totally we, on board we've done all it. different ones it's it actually turns i remember those trips more than i do just mm. generic christmases yep. sleeping on the pullout or mm -hmm. you know whatever whatever it is at the uh at the parents house so. yep Yep. So who knows? Maybe that'll be in the works for next year. Tony, it's, it has worked out and it does not diminish the holiday. I can't say that. Probably enhances it a little bit. I, I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think we're going to have a pretty quiet Christmas, to be honest with you, just because Megan's mom and stepdad both got COVID. 
Oh, my kindly. mom's dealing with an infection of some sort. So, um, but you're going up north. So uh, I don't know if we will. It just no, depends. I depends. think you have to. It's supposed to snow. You're supposed to get a bunch of snow up there. I know. I know. You gotta have. Uh, you gotta have the opportunity we'll to get a white that. white Christmas. Okay. All right. Maybe we will. Okay. Let's move on. Tell us about that opening number. Um. Well, if you're all any of our ages, that's a. I mean, it's turned into a classic. Blink One Eighty Two. Mm. All the small things. Uh. These guys. American, I don't know if you call them rock band. I would say more of like an early rock punk band uh, from from Southern California. Mm. They they came on in the early '90s. Uh, the original lineup was guitarist, guitarist and vocalist Tom DeLonge, bassist and Marcus Mark Hoppus, and drummer Scott Rayner. Uh, they had a significant impact on the punk rock and pop punk genres, influencing numerous bands with their catchy melodies, humorous lyrics, and energetic performances. They continue to be an influential and enduring presence in the alternative rock scene. And you know what? I really like the band, and it's one that I've never seen, shockingly. Yeah, I can't see that's one that I would uh, jump to a, a show, but uh, it's, I mean, every time, I mean, you know, the, you know the stuff. It's, yeah. it, it's a good band. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it's not too late. Not too late. I'm sure they're going to come around, and uh, at some point, we'll see them. Definitely. We talked about seeing Tool. Oh, yeah. yeah. That'd be amazing. I think In that February. Cool. Yeah. On that freaking waste management open weekend. Yeah, that's the same weekend. Oh. Yeah. That's going to be huge. Uh, no idea where that thought just came from, but uh, let's move on. We are in the Diamondback Land Surveying Studio we this are. evening. Um, TK, of course, he has re-upped for next year, so we're excited to have TK and Diamondback on board and all the different endeavors that he has under his umbrella. Um, and I saw some really fun pictures. TK is always having parties, right? And, oh, yeah. And uh, every year he has an ugly sweater party. And every year he posts some of the funnest pictures. And I'm like, wow, we got to get invited to that. Well, we probably are. It's just not yeah, it's here. Well, yeah, you know, it's I mean, not we got an open at. invite to yeah. everything when it comes to TK, I think. But of course. Maybe next year. You never know. Maybe we make the pilgrimage to Vegas and go to TK's ugly sweater party. Maybe, uh, maybe we show up uninvited. Uh, worst things could have happened. Yeah. Yeah. But it looked like a lot of fun. Okay. Next up, we have the Airworks random trivia. What do you um, got for us? Well, look, I'll give you one wild guess what my trivia topic is. Today. Christmas. Nope. <laughs> it is December 21st. I yep. don't want you to talk about the days because these get released, you know, a week and a half sure. later. Yep. Uh, but the December 21st is the winter solstice. Oh, dude, you know what's so funny? I was just <laughs> thinking about that today. Yes, yes. So, wow. uh, you know, for your, uh, if you believe in this sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, for you geography nerds, uh, it is the shortest day of the year in the yep. Northern Hemisphere, yep. uh, opposite in the Southern Hemisphere. So our friends in Australia and mm. New Zealand, mm -hmm. uh, this is the summer solstice for them. And it's actually not even a day. It, there's actually a specific moment. So mm. 8.27 p.m. Phoenix time, okay. you know, here in about two and a half hours, is the moment where the sun finally gets overhead of the Tropic of Capricorn. Really? In the Northern Hemisphere. And for that moment, that is the moment where it, it, it hits and then for then it tilts back and yep. it goes for the rest of the year. Yep. Um, the word comes from solstice comes from Latin and kind of split between two is sol meaning the sun and sestir meaning stand still mm -hmm. as in the, the, the time where the sun stands still. As well as marking the shortest day, the winter solstice marks the first day of winter in the astronomical calendar, mm -hmm. while the meteorological calendar says the we're already been three weeks into winter, for, according to. Gotcha. That's why it's everyone's like, this mm -hmm. is not the start of winter when it's in December. Yep. Um, the day marks the shortest day of the year, but did you know it's almost nine hours shorter than the longest day of the year? Is the it? summer solstice is ju in June is just short of 16 hours, 38 minutes long, while the day in the winter solstice is seven hours and 50 minutes. No kidding. A couple Did of things that. that have also happened on the solstice, winter solstice. The pilgrims arrived in modern day Plymouth, Massachusetts on December 21st, 1620. In uh, the same day in 1898, Pierre and Marie Curie discovered radium <laughs> and on December 21st, 1968, the Apollo 8 spare spacecraft launched, becoming the first crewed moon, moon mission. Also, if you believe that sort of thing. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? <laughs> no comment. Uh, that's topic for a whole other episode. <laughs> 
So 1620, that was the pilgrims? That's the pilgrims. So if you, I don't know if you believe in reincarnation, but if you do, and you were living during that time period, what, like, what, what do you think you would have been? What do you mean, what would I have been? Like in like, the, the pilgrim order of hierarchy, what would you have been? Oh, um, oh, here, here's another fun fact, and, I, and I'll bring this up. Okay. I was about to say I would be one of those like lords or, you know, like <laughs> I would just, I don't know, I feel, I feel like I could dominate people <laughs> in the 1620s. But uh, another it, way back in the uh, day, I think it was in the Romans. I read this when I was doing research that the <laughs> winter solstice way back in the day was like opposite day. And back in Roman times, it was the one day where the slaves could talk shit to oh, the masters no for that one day it was like opposite <laughs> land oh my and, they, God, and that's, that's awesome. where they like they wore masks and yeah. they could be someone else for that one day kind of like the purge yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's so funny <laughs> good stuff appreciate that all right next up we have the advanced genetic surveys also known as ags weekly words of wisdom i got a good one here uh your work is going to fill a large part of your life and the only way to truly be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. Okay. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. Okay. Steve Jobs. Really? Yep. 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 Good old Steve Jobs. I wonder what he's up to these days. Do you know? Is he dead? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> worst so he's not up to much no he's resting he peacefully he is not up to much he is resting peacefully though. sean i'm really excited about this one. Oh yeah yep dimensional geomatics is the latest friend of the program russell white and his team with decades of experience in dimensional control metrology laser scanning and drone operations dimensional geomatics brings together a history of exceptional project execution uh, they really do from a single technician to multiple crews in different locations they field highly trained quality and safety focused personnel for their projects keyword there is safety absolutely and Qualified personnel, whether it's laser scanning, onshore or offshore, refinery or forensics, Dimensional Geomatics has the equipment, people, knowledge, and contacts to fully tailor a solution to meet your needs. Yeah, with over 20 years experience and 24-7 global support, they are just a phone call away. In addition, with accurate and up-to-date LiDAR, from one square acre to a thousand square miles, they can provide you with the deliverables you need. No job is too big or too small. To find out more, go to dimensional-geomatics.com. All right. Sure. On that note, oh, let's get our man. guest in here. Please. Sponsored and presented, of course, by XYHT Magazine. If you haven't got your free digital subscription to XYHT Magazine, take 30 seconds to do it. Yep. XYHT.com for or forward slash subscribe, I believe is that website. Yeah, yeah. And Which it literally cool. takes under a minute and uh, very, very, very much so well worth that minute. Uh, so check it out. We have um, Sean Asher with Allen and Company with us this That's evening. Right. A little bit off Sean before we loop him in here. Born and raised in rural Maryland, uh, currently lives in Florida. But he uh, he said when, when the, the, the area where he grew up, super rural, surrounded by Amish, um Amish, okay yeah so we'll have to circle back on that a little bit um he is a, he was a geospatial intel analyst in the army thank you for your service and um mm -hmm. also attended american military university where he got his degree in business uh he is currently the integration and partnership manager at allen and company and he's passionate about problem solving and spirituality Interesting. Very interesting. Sean, welcome to the Geohawks. Thanks for taking the time to join us this evening. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, guys. You betcha. Um, so let's circle back on a couple of things. Well, um, we don't, we, we, I want to do this uh, icebreaker. You oh, you're so excited? Uh, yeah. You want to do that first? Yeah, let's do it first. All right, let's do that first. So we have the Trimble Pro Point icebreaker like we do every week. Um, so this is this is my icebreaker. I think it's going to be good. You, you Hopefully you okay. are on the same page here. Okay. So thinking about who you are as a person your personality your values blah 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 if you were going to be a car what car would you be hmm that's tough man um, it could be an old car a new car it can be anything what, what do you think sean what would you be 
probably a Cadillac Escalade. It's like very oh. comfortable. It's a little flashy. Uh -huh. It looks nice. It runs nice, but it's yep. very comfortable and luxurious to sit in. Oh, I like it. I like yeah. it. Do you have one? No, absolutely no. not. Yeah, it's, no. the, it's the dream one day for sure. I've yeah, been dreaming right. about that for a long time. Jacked up on like 35s. <laughs> yeah. There you go. How much you shot? Any ideas? Um, you know, I would probably be, uh, I don't know, like a, like an old Mustang or something like classic, not huh? like a classic, but, route? but not like, not so classic that, mm -hmm. you know, you, uh, like a drivable classic, uh -huh. like one that you would, you would fix up, but not just to take to the car shows. Cause I'm not that pretty, but, oh, gotcha. but, uh, you know, a, an old school have a little bit of muscle, but still a daily driver, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a best, daily driver classic. Best of both be. worlds. As one might say, uh, I like to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Uh, minivan? Uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> minivan fits me perfectly. <laughs> oh, what would I be? I, I'd be, man, oh man. I'm, I think like a Porsche. I think a Porsche GT3. Turbo, okay. Turbo. A little exotic? Yeah, a little exotic. Just something you could drive really hard, you know? Okay. All and right. still keeps on ticking. Um, I think that'd be me. Oh, sure. Okay. All right. Uh, I do have one quick one. I just want to ask because it came yeah. up in the office today and somebody asked. Oh, okay. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll ask Sean first. Uh, would you rather be itchy or sticky? <laughs> Oh man. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> Probably itchy because I do a lot of customer facing, a lot of handshaking, and I would not want them to walk away with like, what is going on with that dude's hands? <laughs> well, you could say the same thing for sticky, but I, I like where you're at. Uh, Kent, uh, what do you got? I, I think <laughs> Neither is not an option. <laughs> I think for me, it is without question sticky. Ah, I'm the I'm, I'm the same way. Like because like every I, little I, I could, itch I get drives me insane. And I'm trying to figure out the reason for it. Oh no, no, then I'm I'm the opposite. And like, it like I like like when my hair gets long. Like right now, I need haircuts so bad. That's why I'm wearing a hat. Like my head gets itchy, right? So at night, it's like I'm scratching my head, and then I'm like looking to see if hair is falling out or whatever, you know. It's like, but no, for me it is definitely sticky. Uh, I'm the opposite. I I cannot handle being sticky. Like so I, would, I would rather just itch a little bit than like, you know, if like you, you eat an orange or itchy though, I, I, I'm understanding yeah, it like you're like, constantly itchy. Yeah. Same like thing. It's like, constantly what itchy. if like your hands are just always sticky and you can never, never <sighs> not. I, I don't it's a hard know. one. It's, like, it's one of those things that's tough. That, that I, I, anyway, I just know how much being itchy drives me insane. Like to the brink, basically. Mm, so yeah. for that reason alone, I, I can would understand go. That. Uh, I would go sticky. All right, uh, that's a good one, though. I like that. Yeah, yeah, that's I thought so. I thought yeah. so. We'll have to reuse that one sometime. So Sean, I grew up in rural Maryland around the Amish. Um, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it was middle of nowhere. I think my high school graduating class was like 120, 130. Oh, wow. um, we had a naval base that opened up. Probably when I was a young kid, five or six years old, that uh, it's like a research naval base, Pax River. And, um, you know, that started to develop the, the area a lot. But, yeah, every day going to school in the spring, the the whole school smelled like manure because they're, you know, putting down manure <laughs> to put in the fresh tobacco or corn, nice. whatever they're growing. And it was oh, you know, the entire school every day in the yeah. spring smelled like manure. We were called cow pie yeah. high. Oh. <laughs> Yep. Oh, hi, hi. Yep. oh my god that is awesome um <laughs> tell us a little bit about uh your time in the army and what, what your job was there what's a geospatial intel analyst that sounds really interesting yeah so first there's a little backstory there my wife and i are middle school sweethearts we met in middle oh my school. god that's amazing yep, for sure i remember what i saw her saw i remember what she was wearing the first time i saw her and it's you know been uh been a wild ride since then um, does she still have that outfit by chance god no 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 i wish she i bring I it up and like remember it and she's like i cannot believe i wore that you know? <laughs> yeah um awesome. so i uh 
got out of high school and I spent uh, the first semester in community college and I was not the smartest of kids and I spent a three week in three weeks in an English class that was Monday, Wednesday and Friday and it was a two hour class and the first three weeks were how to use commas and I was like I am not <laughs> I'm not doing this this is not for me I still so, don't use them right <laughs> yeah right exactly um so my wife at the time, or she was my girlfriend then, but at the time she was like, well, you're not in community college. You're not doing anything with your life. We can't be together. I was like, okay. So I went to, took the ASVAB, uh, went and talked to the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, the Marines. Um, you know, Army had the shortest wait list to get in um, <laughs> and decided to join the Army, uh, qualified for anything in any of the branches. Um, and when I was looking... I was going to be a mortuary affairs specialist. Like that's, that's really, I was, I was really not working with a full box of crayons at the time, guys. Uh, it's uh, awesome. You're going to have, you, I'm sorry. You're going to have, we have to stop mortuary for a second. You're going to have to affairs. go into uh, what exactly is a mortuary affairs specialist? Somebody that prepares the bodies. Yeah. Somebody that prepares the bodies for funerals. Um, they oh, had a signing wow. bonus and it was like 50 grand. And I was like, dad, <laughs> It's a 50 grand signing bonus if I do this. He's like, what are you going to do afterwards, you dummy? And so, uh, <laughs> you know, went through the list of what, you know, what was opening and, you know, the, yeah. what would send me to basic in the next two or three months. Because, you know, my wife was like, you got to do something with your life if we're going to be together. So, OK, yeah. I'm doing something. Uh, so. 35 golf geospatial intel analyst uh he typed it into google and said this seems interesting it seems like you'll have a career do that and i was like okay signed it signed my name to it um <laughs> so it's a lot of using satellite imagery using um satellite imagery uh lidar and all the geospatial tools you know arc gis shape files mm -hmm. polygons points lines raster images all that to help support intel missions to support our troops over abroad abroad wow that's cool uh, okay yep. that's cool so was that your introduction to uh geo geospatial in general yeah, for sure. So, okay. um, you know, it, everything from creating raid packets of how does it, you know, what's the terrain slope analysis for a helicopter to land and, you know, taking human intelligence reports of, of what the bad guy X's compound looks like and it's in this city and it's near this thing and then trying to find that in the in the actual updated satellite imagery so a lot of overlap with you know kind of all the different aspects of of the geospatial community mm -hmm. very very cool got anything else there Sean no no I'm just thinking about the what it's like to start in this industry from the army instead of mm -hmm. Yeah, you interesting, know, right? It's it, it's a it's a different it's a different origin story than we're used to. Sure. Usually, it's uh, you know I was in college and I was failing out of this, and I met a guy said, at a bar. I met a guy at a bar. He said, "Why don't you try geospatial?" And then uh, you know how said I could start tomorrow, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, breathe on this mirror, and then I had a job. So. Uh, For that's the army, it though. was it was no joke in the army. Our schooling is called um, AIT. And in AIT, we had the highest attrition rate of any career in the Army, any field in the Army at the time. And it's, you know, it was difficult. Like, you get a, a, a satellite image of a Russian motor pool, and it's covered in wow. snow. And you've got to identify how many tanks were made in 1956 versus the tanks that are made Dang. in 1957. They're covered in snow. And if you get two or three <laughs> numbers wrong, like, you're, you're wow. washed out. You're out of there. So... Wow. Yeah, it was it was very intense schooling. And if you watched that out, is... you went to explosive ordnance disposal, which <laughs> was I don't know, pass. That was your penalty, pass. right? Your punishment. Yeah. 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 Would you rather prep the bodies at the mortuary yeah, or, right. <laughs> or yep. dispose of, or dispose uh, of explosives? explosives. <laughs> right. Oh man! All right, let's get on to some uh, more serious stuff here. Yeah. So, uh, how did you uh, talk about your transition into the private sector and uh, kind of what you've been doing since then? Yeah. So once I got out, I spent a little while working in counterterrorism, and that was, you know, pretty cool. Um, <laughs> you know, working and trying to keep the country safe and and map out networks of bad guys. That was a lot wow. of fun. But um, 
you know, there's not really a ton of career progression in it. Like Mm -hmm. you can be a really good analyst with a year of experience and you can be the same level of analyst with 20 years of experience and the, in government um, Mm -hmm. contracts like that, there's only slotting for X number of seats and it doesn't, doesn't really matter how good you are. So there was not really a ton of upward movement for me in that other than like program management, which is really just dollars and cents and numbers and you know all that it wasn't really fulfilling so um decided to transition latched on with a uh army geospatial center contract that was um called buckeye through uh, lidos is the company the program was called buckeye and they um send lidar and photogrammetry capture planes to um, bases all over the world and those those the operation is to help the troops on ground with updated imagery and LIDAR requests for <laughs> whatever they're doing. You know, we're not read on to the program or the mission at the time. We just know, hey, you need new imagery and LIDAR of this area. Okay, it'll take us a day or two. So really wow. dove in head first into the, the whole LIDAR world for that experience. So, and, I mean, I know you can't talk about the specific applications, <laughs> but, I mean, are we talking about, like, Hey, I need to know if uh, there's a bunch of stuff over that mountain or, hey, I need to know how wide this thing is, if I can get a truck through it or like what, what exactly are they trying to get out of that request? Yeah, so it can be that, Um, you know, there were a couple sites and a couple different times where we're flying imagery over the same spot every day just to see if the vehicles have moved or if, you know, there's any, any nefarious activity um you know one of the i was sent to kenya there's a small special forces base that's there for anything popping up in in (laughs) um, east africa specifically somalia um and there was the bonnie forest it's called and the maps of that forest haven't been updated since like 1870 or something like that and wow. you know hand drawn uh, and it was you know we're, we're <clears throat> updating that map to stop al-shabaab terrorists from coming through somalia into kenya and poaching elephants so you know it's a, a wide array <laughs> based off of <laughs> where you are and where you're deployed and you know what they need uh, and how they help to fight bad guys i guess Here's my takeaway from this. Yeah, uh, your day was not as important as you, as you thought it was. I have to what lived these guys are doing. a ridiculously boring <laughs> life. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like, damn it, I've wasted so much time. Yeah, that's kind of done cool shit like that. I know, right? <laughs> oh was, man, that's awesome. Funny just and fighting Kenya. over section corners and stuff, <laughs> right, like, a, right, like a loser yeah. versus fighting bad guys. <laughs> it's funny right. in Kenya every day. Um, it, it, we had monkeys, baby monkeys, just jumping on the tent. They wake up at oh. sunrise. They're ready to chase bugs. They just start playing and running around oh. and chasing bugs. And the guys Dang. get so, so pissed because the monkeys are waking it up. I'm like, dude, you're oh. never going to have a monkey alarm clock again. Like, <laughs> right. Soak it in. This is awesome. What are you talking my about? Weakness, my weakness, what two of my weaknesses, baby monkeys and baby goats. Mm, baby goats oh they're the cutest things these uh, goats like hop around oh i want one so bad i agree Not with me. you i agree they with what? you but the people that do goat yoga i can't i can't get into that <laughs> oh uh, yeah. yeah i I'm can't do that person. yeah yeah baby goat yoga uh, i can see that for you can't. oh lord okay all right let's learn more about alan and company um <laughs> Talk about talk about the company a little bit, you know, kind of like what the culture is like, what you love about it and, you know, the services you guys provide. Yep. So Allen and Company, a traditional surveying and mapping company headquartered in Winter Garden, Florida. Uh, they've been around since 1988. A lot mm. of the original customers that they had in 1988 are still returning year after year. Uh, do a lot of surveying for home builders, property stakeouts, a lot of, you know, creating taking large chunks of land and making them small chunks of land for resale. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of that type of stuff, we have a Sioux department for subsurface utility, underground exploration. And we also have an advanced technologies department, um, which is designed to really understand all of the cutting edges technologies in 
the entire survey field and you know really dive into them and master them and figure out which ones are applicable to which departments and how to utilize them to help them do their work faster. Mm -hmm. Let's focus mostly on the advanced technology group. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I noticed, you know, checking out the website and that type thing, I mean, you guys are technology driven, you know, whether it be UAVs, 3D modeling, you know, laser scanning, LIDAR capture, what have you. Um, talk about those services specifically. Yeah, so um, a lot of what we do is to try to save time and money for our customers. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of traditional ways of doing things and there's a lot of technology that can help um help cut costs and save customers money on their project. And, you know, as, as well as just hard cash for the deliverables, there's also the aspect of saving money in terms of turnaround time and then being able to move quicker on their projects. So mm -hmm. the advanced technology department's really designed to help do that for all of the branches through the company. I think, um, before I started, um, years and years and years ago, the company bought a LIDAR unit and then, you know, that unit fit the one department, but it didn't, it filled our construction department and the construction department's needs, but it did not fit what the land department was trying to do. So mm -hmm. they spun off the, the technology piece into a separate department and, and kind of leveraged it and went about it that way. Yeah. Mm. So this is a sidebar question, but you know, you're talking about being able to by utilizing technology, you can do things, you know, faster, that type thing. So my, from, from a business perspective, and Sean probably knows the question I'm going to ask, just because you can do things faster, should you do them cheaper? So it, it's a fine line, right? And it depends on kind of where you're at and it depends on what your customers are expecting and what they're used to, you know, um, there are areas of the country that it's, you know, there's not a lot of competition and it's not a lot of competing for prices. You know, somebody needs a survey mm -hmm. done, they've got three or four shops that they can call. Um, where we are near Orlando in a major metropolitan area, there's probably 50, 60 survey companies that they could call. Um, sure. So it behooves us to try to figure out how to stay competitive. And mm -hmm. we found that, you know, segregating the advanced technologies, which is, you know, somewhat of a research and development department and somewhat a, you know, its own profit center as well. We found that that really helps us save costs and time and money against our competition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair enough. That's a good answer, actually. Very good answer. Really good answer. Like yeah. a, like a, uh, sounds like a normal person answer, not in the uh, normal person. Answer. Well, sometimes you get the answer like you kind of get off on of like you live in a bubble that isn't in the real world that isn't in a space where other people can can also access. It's not like you have the patent on this technology. You, you just bought it and the other guy may not have. So you still have to factor in your competition and it still has to in the climate that you're doing it. So you're saying I'm not a normal person. I think. Uh, we're on episode 198, yeah. and 198 uh, episodes prove that you are not a normal person. Fair enough. <laughs> so you mentioned a project that you guys have, I don't know if you're currently work on, working on or you did work on it that was really interesting. It was called Tucker Ranch. Talk about that project just a little bit. Tucker Ranch. So um, when I started, the survey, the land department, the surveyors in the land department didn't really have full trust in the technology. And that's so fair because a lot of the yep. LIDAR technology, especially with the growth in the last two or three years has become black box and surveyors mm. are not black box folk. You know, they, they want Love to that. know what's happening. They want to know the math behind it. They want to know the repeatability and the proof of why things work. So, um, you know, in Tucker Ranch started out with taking our equipment internal to us and going and scanning a site. Uh, our survey department went from one bench run, one benchmark, did a uh, leveled run through the entire loop of the parking lot and then ended at a, another benchmark and closed that loop at, I want to say, um, 0 0.016 feet. Hmm. 0 0.016 feet. Yep. Sure. 
So then we set control on top of that and we went and scanned the site with our particular equipment that we have in house. And, you know, we're determined to, well, let's, you know, proliferate this information, put it on LinkedIn and, and show not just our surveyors, but show surveyors in the rest of the community what these pieces of equipment can do. Mm-hmm. From there, we decided to open that up to the rest of the LIDAR vendors that we have connections with through the last 10 years of being in this industry. And the buy-in was absolutely incredible. Um, We had nine LIDAR manufacturers, hardware manufacturers come out to the site, scan their, scan the site with their pieces of equipment and (laughs) ended up with 17 individual data sets. We have another three in the can right now that we're getting ready to go through and add to the, the repository. And we have, I think, four or five more that, you know, the latest and greatest version of the sensor comes out and they want to scan it with the site so that the information can be out there for the general public to do. So are you going to prepare like a white paper or something like that to uh, reflect these findings? Yep. So we do have a white paper Um, for this particular one. um, A lot of the hardware vendors, from my knowledge, from others in the industry that have been around as, as long as I have and some, you know, much longer, there's kind of been nothing done like this where you can compare apples to apples of one sensor to another on the exact same site. For us to have this, um, for us to have this done and get buy-in from the manufacturers, we could not declare a winner or a loser because the goal of it was not to disparage anybody. It was just mm-hmm. to show the the users and potential purchasers of equipment what is out there, what are your options, and what does the, a data set from that manufacturer look like versus another manufacturer on the exact same site. You know, a lot of, if you're looking to buy a specific sensor, they might send you a data set from the Eiffel Tower. You're like, okay, cool. This is the Eiffel Tower. That's really great data. How does this fit? And then another manufacturer sends you a data set from Seattle and you're like, how do I, how do I compare these two things and figure out which one is the best decision for me? So our goal in this was really to just get apples and apples on the same site, release that information to the general community and allow them to be able to look at it and make informed decisions about what is best for them. So our white paper is really just kind of, you know, if you're looking to do this type of stuff, these sensors would work. If you're looking to do this type of stuff, these sensors would work. And if you're looking to do this, this sensors would work for you. So interesting. I love, I I love it. I I can't wait to see those results but where you can i mean and and I, and I think sean's right of like it's just it's a it's a it's a case that you know it's it's a user case sure. you know it's yeah. like, this might work like he's saying i i, I immediately go to don't say the name because we might like them or we might have that guy on next week and he's the guy that didn't you know it's and it's that's yeah. not necessarily the idea and i'm i'm right. guessing you got there was not a a vendor that was not something you could use where it was just so depending on the application depending on the application and and no matter what you got data out of all of it yeah super cool correct like every every sensor isn't the perfect tool for every application depending on you know what your client's expecting what the expected deliverable is could have a direct effect on which sensor yeah you're not trying to be the consumer reports of lidar hardware and right because I was curious if you were making any friends or enemies through this exercise. Well, so from our understanding, it's actually helped some of the vendors, you know, move some units and Mm -hmm. and help, you know, put their names out there a little bit better. Um, So it's been, it's, I expected positive feedback, but I didn't expect the overwhelming positive feedback from both the vendor side and the, and the, the user side. I I, I just didn't, you know, I thought it would be cool. And I thought there'd just be a bunch of LIDAR nerds that download it. Maybe it's a hundred, but I think we're at like, I'd have to look up the statistic again, but I think we're well over 750 downloads now. So that's amazing. And it's all over the world too. We we had downloads from Singapore and it's like, wow, that's incredible. Yep. Kudos to you guys for doing something like that. I mean, it's something I've always thought about, you know, like taking a project and having a bunch of different, you know, manufacturers come in and doing the same thing and comparing the results. But uh, yeah, I'm really excited to check out those results. For oh sure. yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So again, focusing on the advanced technology team, um, you know, you guys are leveraging things like digital twins and uh, AR and VR visualizations. Uh, how 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 is that? I guess enhancing your client experience. So a lot of clients. Um typically call us and they need a survey and you know they they need a survey because it's it's the document that another document says they need right the the legal county record says you need this survey signed by somebody with the pls and you know so they pay for that they go do that and then it's a stamp and then you know it either sits in the inbox and their email and you know after that it just sits there until their inbox their gmail account is full and then they go delete all the old ones <laughs> some people companies will print it out and then it sits in a shelf forever and it just kind yeah. of dies um you know our biggest thing is if you are putting in the work to have a survey done you know what can we do to create that survey as a living representation that can hold through the life of the project so <laughs> you know with our land department you know somebody buys four acres and they're going to build a, a medical facility or they're going to build um i think the most recent one was a uh, industrial pharmaceutical they're making like vitamin c gummies or something i don't you know i don't it could be pot gummies for all i know nowadays but um <laughs> probably they bought the they bought the land and they're 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 building some sort of manufacturing facility that needs to fit these certain compliances so they need a survey i'm like okay you need a survey cool what are you doing after this right so then <laughs> they tell us that it's going to become this manufacturing facility i'm like okay how does your manufacturing facility layout look how do these things fit into the space are you are you tracking that yet or is it just kind of like a 2d cad drawing that somebody yep. gave you and it looks like it makes sense or are you looking to really understand that a little bit better in an immersive environment so a lot of those conversations mm. kind of open up organically just from saying like hey have you thought about this yet or have you thought about that yet um you know one of the biggest things we're trying to focus on for our clients now is you know okay once everything's done then what do you do you know where's mm -hmm. where's your documentation about where every wire is running from that lights that light switch all the way over there to your panel to your breaker panel yeah. and do you have any real-time feedback into something that tells you the temperature and the flow of, of of how the air is moving or how much electricity is going so a lot of the things we're we're trying to focus on in the future is you know how do you take that survey and all the data that you're already collecting for a survey and turn that into something that continues to provide value instead of sitting on a shelf and dying mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great answer. And I love it because he, he mentioned a couple of things are, you know, the, the immersive experience, right? And what you guys are doing is you're constantly building value for your client. And you're able to, as a result, suggest these upsell type applications, right? Yep. I love that. Well, I mean, it's a, it's kind of the, fir the the first time I've heard someone go past a static, even if it's the the best, you know, the 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 best technology we have. It's still a static represent as mm -hmm. representation of that in in that time. Yeah. And w what Sean is talking about is is kind of the next step here. Of okay, it's great that it's a digital twin, but it was when that was scanned. Yeah. And you know take you know the next step is you're actually going in real time and you know that's the base model but then you know oh it's right you know here's some temperature readings and some yeah. and some i guess electrical read or whatever it might be mm -hmm. and then you're looking at uh facility maintenance in real time and for sure when people yeah. are going in to see the health of a building which mm -hmm. sounds kind of odd but it's yeah. it's a real thing it's a real thing and uh, it kind of combines the best, the, similar to when we were talking to the Trimble guy about uh, sense or uh, what, what was it? it was like the real time sensing of mm -hmm. like they're just taking constant shots constant. of uh, 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 yep. like incorporating that with. Yep. And then what did he say? Like 47 sensors on this one thing that you can yep. uh, just the data that you 100 percent. And then that's the next question I have. Oh, that is, was where I was going. Go okay. for it. How how do you manage that? You manage all this. Yes, like, it's one thing to collect a billion points and a and a petabyte or whatever file that you just have to do something with. This is a 
it constantly adding, you know, you get into whatever is after a petabyte, eventually it just gets like too much, right? Or do you, do you like constantly purge or how do you, how do you manage that? We are like the company that I work for, we do a ton of this reality capture stuff and it's a challenge. It's, and, I mean, and, and you're not collecting in real time. You're just grabbing oh, gotcha. it and no, then right, it sits right. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, da data management is the biggest challenge right now. Data management is definitely the biggest challenge. You know, we spend a lot of time, you know, my professional motto for myself and what I try to do every day is, is just be impressed with people's problems before I try to solve them, before mm. I try to throw out a solution, spend a minute or two and really wrap my head around the complexity and spend time like, oh, wow. That's a, that's a problem. That's wild. How mm -hmm. do we do that? So a lot of the decisions on data management are really driven by um, the customer for the IOT type of information, how that's housed, how we, how long we store that and, you know, how, how long that data lives um, for the point cloud data. A lot of that is starting to get killed in my opinion um mm -hmm. you know reality meshes like preview 3d um you know you can you can turn that lidar point cloud and the photogrammetry behind it that a, a single point cloud can be 500 gigs and you know once it's in the reality <laughs> mesh you're compressing it down to something that fits on a floppy disk you know I, I, nobody has floppy disks anymore but we ran right. out to to buy on ebay two boxes yeah. of floppy disk and put our logo on them to show people like, Hey, this data becomes this now, you know, a mm. floppy disk size. So a lot of the compression is done through there. And then a lot of the other decisions are driven by the client. Yeah. And is everything cloud-based then? Uh, it depends on client specific needs. So, mm, okay. um, you know, if, if it's medical records or if it's a utility, mm. certain utilities do not allow their, their mm -hmm. data to be housed on a cloud. Government doesn't allow their data to be housed on a cloud. So it, it yeah. really depends on the, the customer specific and, you know, what we try to pride ourselves in is, you know, understanding their needs at a higher level and really diving in as opposed to just like signing a contract and doing mm -hmm. the simple thing for them okay well you, you need this simple thing do you need this do you need that have you mm -hmm. thought about this you know let's make sure that we're going the extra mile as best we can for you for sure hey can, can i talk about diamondback land surveying for a second please do by far our favorite friend of the program their surveying department offers land surveying applications for residential commercial and public works projects across the western u.s their respected mapping team provides commercial subdivision and plat mapping easements and legal document preparation dbls is dedicated to building and maintaining an excellent reputation in the construction and development communities by constantly providing top-notch services for our clients trent keenan and his team of professionals look forward to the opportunity to work with you to find out more simply go to diamondbacklandsurveying.com and while we're on the topic we might as well talk about get kids into survey yeah, I think we have to. Get Kids Into Survey began in 2017 by Elaine Ball with the creation of the first Get Kids Into Survey poster that reflected a fun resource for the survey community to share with their children in order to help them understand what their parents did at work. The response from the industry members was so overwhelmingly encouraging that just two years later, they have a whole range of survey posters in production and we have distributed over 60,000 copies globally. I have a feeling it's even more than that. As the Get Kids in the Survey community expands globally through its network of sponsors and brand ambassadors, the project now includes full programs of work for educators, scholarship opportunities, and a ton of resources that will inspire the next generation of surveyors. Education is our passport to the future, as they say. Find out more by simply going to getkidsintosurvey.com. Um, are you a licensed surveyor, Sean? I am not. Uh, I just finished my bachelor's degree. It took a lot longer than I thought it would because, you know, I started in going for a degree in counterterrorism and then switched to a degree in GIS. <laughs> and then I was like, I can't keep switching. I need to just finish my degree. So I ended up with a degree uh, awesome. in uh, uh, business. Awesome. So I think I'm starting up in two or three weeks at University of Florida to get the geomatic certificate to become a licensed surveyor. 
Very cool. And I'm, I'm going to ask you this question, and, and knowing that, I think I have an idea what your answer is going to be, but maybe not. Um, all this reality capture stuff, right, the scanning, the LiDAR, everything that goes along with it, in your mind, do you think that a licensed surveyor should uh, – or do you think that those technologies, that hardware, that software, does it take a licensed surveyor to oversee that work? Oh, good question. Um, you know, I, I've always been the LIDAR guy and I've always trusted the survey guy or gal to tell me how accurate the data needs to be or what it needs to be. Mm. And it's, and it's, it's a tandem thing because if I'm, I'm going to go get my licensure at some point in time, that will happen. But if I'm the smartest survey in the room and I'm doing the LIDAR, that's a problem. Like we're, Mm -hmm. we're slacking on the survey side for sure. If I'm the smartest Mm -hmm. surveyor in the room. So to me, it's always a tandem thing. Um, I think in 10 years where this industry is headed, I think the need for a license signature to, to be present will be more and more prevalent as mm. reality capture grows and as things are done um, and, and not done from a survey perspective, there will be incurred costs to then go back and try to make that a survey <laughs> accurate mm. data set. So I think in 10 years, you know, mm. it'll be more more of a reason to have it done or supervised or signed and sealed by sure. a licensed surveyor. Yeah, and it kind of depends on the client's requirements. You know, you've mentioned that a number of times. Um, not everything needs to be survey grade, right? I mean, is that do you agree with that statement? I do, but I try to convince people of the value of it every chance we get. Um, you know, we're working with a, a hockey stadium down here and, you know, talking about what a digital twin would look like for them and, you know, what type yep. of capabilities they would want a digital twin to do. And we can do all those things for sure. You know, we can do the scan, we can do the mesh, we can put that into unity, unreal, create iPhone or iPad tablets for whatever type of functionality you need. We can Mm -hmm. do that. But when you start to do a renovation to that, why, why wouldn't we set survey control first? Why wouldn't we go through and go, it's an arduous process. It'll add, you know, 15, 20% to the bottom dollar of this whole project, but you know, it can be, if we do that, then Mm -hmm. it can do other things for you down the road that you're, we're not even thinking about today. Um, There are projects that we do where we're scanning and creating meshes of objects for simulations, you know, Um, how do you, they they're creating VR and AR simulations of how do you change the hydraulic fluid of this aircraft. And typically they'd sit Hmm. there and the team of modelers would sit there and spend weeks and weeks and weeks on that project. And for us to scan it and turn it into a mess for them is, you know, a day's worth of work, two days worth of work. Um, So it's things like that. We don't really need survey control because it's, you know, it doesn't really Mm -hmm. matter where it is in the world, but yeah, it just mm-hmm. depends on client specifications and what they're looking to do and where they're looking to go with it. I have thoughts. Your wheels are spinning over there. It's like well, there's steam coming out of your ears. What is I, happening? I've just been thinking about this a lot because it's a question that we ask a lot and talk to a lot of different people about. Mm-hmm. And and I'm just thinking about the evolution of where this is all going. And, okay, so, you know, it, it, and Sean mentioned it where, you know, why not just – have it be survey grade well to me survey like, why grade wouldn't or, you i love well, that statement why wouldn't you but to me that's just you're just, it's just geo referenced right that's the whole point is to be able to tie it into something else or you know let's take that example of the hockey rink and you go in there but what is it going to matter if everything is going to be scanned in digital twins and you just need a, a surveyor to be able to match up the two twins yeah. Or is to match up the the digital twin data with the sidewalk on the outside of the you know, like mm. somehow you need to tie it together. But within that space, I I, I don't see it. And yeah. I, and I think where this is going is you know it's almost like think about what you might need with it later. Mm-hmm. But the technology is going to be where. It, it it doesn't take all that effort to tie it to it, it you know you come in and say okay well on the earth this is the coordinate and mm-hmm. then 
boop, 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 and then it all just snaps to it, and you but, move on. But even on the even from a geo referencing perspective, but what is the it question matter? is like, all... how accurate does the geo referencing need to be? Does it need to be within a centimeter, or can it be plus or minus three feet? I mean, what you just said is a big, big difference. And in construction world, uh, a, a centimeter, centimeters, nothing like yeah. it's uh, give me a, give me a couple tenths and we'll have to figure it out in between that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. So I'm just, I, it, I almost want the, I don't want the, the surveyors to stay in the antiquated area of, well, no, this is where that rebar is. And that's still there. <laughs> yes. I want them to start pulling in geo, like the geo yeah. referencing into the same space and then just do it where you don't have to come in and add 20%. It's yeah. all right. Here's the basis that the football stadium is, as it has a digital twin and the hockey stadium has a digital twin and it shouldn't take that much to get those guys on the same. Yeah. Plane, I agree. So does yeah. Pun in, pun intended. Yeah. So by the way, I I, I purchased your house in the metaverse, and oh, your cool. property lines are off three feet. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I care? <laughs> you guys bring up a an interesting point about matching twin to twin um, and data aggregation. Um, you know, one of the car manufacturers, I can't say who because it's NDA, but one of them collects their data from their, their self-driving cars and their LIDAR. And that data is not super accurate, right? Because it's just GPS based and it's, you know, your Z is way all over the place, right? But mm -hmm. through just the sheer number of data points that they have, they've got the most accurate paint lines for anything you know like even if mm -hmm. you're you have yeah. 50 cars that drove the road and and <laughs> the gps is bad or the data is bad just through the sheer aggregate you're going to hit the 95th percentile of confidence of where x y that line is so Relative. i mean it is a very interesting point that at some point it in is. time your your aggregate data gives you a a close enough answer to where things actually are yeah. yeah, I love that comment. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where it's high level about stuff where this right is, there. Where it's going. Yeah, and you've got a billion points that hit that same spot, and mm -hmm. somehow some old geezer is still going to have to put a tripod down and say, "No, sorry, yeah. let me take seventeen <laughs> hours to show that the the Waymo passed this point." Now, granted, it's going to be off, but you know, eventually that starts to narrow down, and the error that's yeah. On 95 percentile of a billion points yeah. is probably the same error that a drunk 80 year old surveyor is going to get out in the field. That was just, very just, just my point. That was very stereotypical <laughs> of you to say, Sean, <laughs> Sorry. a drunk surveyor. <laughs> We're, I've never seen one of those. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh, man. So, so um, present company excluded smart Sean over here. Um, what is, what's some advice you would give to companies that are considering taking the plunge and spending the money to, um, start to, you know, incorporate some of these technologies? I'm sure there's a right way and a wrong way of doing it. What, what, what advice could you give? Whew. To me, it starts with people invest in your people, you know, mm -hmm. um, it can get really expensive really quickly to try to hire the the best people out there and the best brains and somebody that has all of the experience that you need that can get really quickly that can get really expensive really quickly because there's not a ton of colleges that are offering classes mm. and how to work with lidar or how to you know yeah, it's, good just, point. it's just not a thing so um you know taking your people who learn quickly replacing them inside of your organization so that the work does not decline and giving them the opportunity to learn the new skills and grow their new skills in my eyes is the best ROI that survey companies can have. Mm, yeah, that's really good advice. So from your perspective, whether it be you or, you know, Alan and company in general, how do you guys stay on top of these emerging technologies? It's expensive. It's very expensive to do it. Um, I, I, I wish I could sugarcoat it and tell you that there's a clear and easy path, but it's it's mm -hmm. it's really not. Um, you know, a lot of. 
people want a quick and simple solution and then at some point in time they realize it's it's not as quick and simple there's a lot of nuance there's a lot of complex stuff going on the the time to train and learn how all of the different things you know a, a simple drone for example a lidar drone like mm -hmm. you can get a, a one out of the box and it's a press button software but the press button is is analyzing the IMU data and it's leveraging the satellites in the sky and the GPS and you can't select a, a mask angle for how many what angle the satellites have to be at to be able to get good satellite coverage and you just import your ground control coordinates and if you don't have great data and the black box software warps it it will just warp your data and then when you try to mm. grid it and create one foot contours you, you'll have one foot contours but when someone else goes checks and does check shots or you know tries to build something on that site it's not going to work you know like something you're going to get yeah. a big red flag really quickly so it's a it's a long process there's a, a lot of patience involved and there's um you know, whatever you think you're going to spend, plan to spend more than that because it's it's mm. a process. <clears throat> yeah, and then it gets to be what, like it gets to the point where it's like there are already experts in the field doing this. Why not just hire them, right? <laughs> versus yep. incurring that massive expense to try to do it in house. You know. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm a big believer in working smarter, not harder. Well, it's yep. like 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 you said, it all it it's not always going to work and you're not always going to figure it out immediately. And you may buy that thing Oof. and it just oh, doesn't, yeah. If you don't know what you're doing, and it doesn't happen. And then, and then you're like, well, shit, do I have enough projects to keep trying to right. make this actually work? Or yeah. should I just hire a guy and let him do it a half a dozen times mm -hmm. until it really makes, you know, you know, business sense that my, my opportunity cost is so much that I just have to buy it instead mm -hmm. of, Yep. The, the thought that, well, if I do it two times faster, then I can make twice as much more money with this equipment that I can't afford anyway. 100%. Well said, John. Not so smart, John. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait to watch, make my wife watch this. She's going to hate every minute of it. Right. You're hyping me up so hard here. Like, I'm, I'm king of the world right now. Oh, man. Um, so, so, yeah, so, so I'm asking, we, we talked about a lot of things, uh, new technology wise, what you guys are doing, incorporating, I'm sure you have an idea on where this might be going. Like, all right, what are we, what are we not doing yet? And, mm. and just on that same topic, what, what have you just bought? That's going to be obsolete in five years, because this is going to be the new wave and five that's years. what you're really looking forward to. <laughs> One thing that I will gladly bash and say that eventually this is going <laughs> to crash it. and I will clip this and I will post it on my LinkedIn in five, 10 years, whenever it happens is credit based or token based cloud processing software. Mm. At Ooh. some point in time, everybody is going to push towards that. And then it's going to hit market saturation. I, I took econ 101 and I did okay at it. It was like a B minus, but it was okay. Oh, so no, that's, hit, that, that, that's a solid grade there, Sean. Don't, it was, don't, don't say it was American military university. Smart Sean. Though. It's okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it wasn't Harvard. <laughs> anyway, right. so it's going to hit market saturation. You know, everybody will have to be forced to use that and people are not going to want to do that. So then companies will start coming along and saying, you don't have to use credit-based so processing software. Mm. Buy our tech and you can do it on-prem <laughs> yourself and you won't have to incur these extra costs mm. that every single project and then that will start to change that trend of everybody doing token or credit-based processing hmm. uh, is that similar to well like every every software you buy now uh, you don't even buy it it's just has hmm. to be by the user by the month like everyone's mm -hmm. starting to get sick of that and yep. it's like okay i don't need a hundred users and 15 grand a month. Just yeah. let me buy the thing for a thousand bucks and get my money out of it. Yeah. Like it sounds like a very similar thing where we're going to hit that saturation where people just get sick and tired. And one guy is going to be like, you know what? Yeah. I'll just throw it out there and then, and it'll take it from there. That's, that's actually one of yeah. the more interesting yeah. uh, answers to that question that, that we've gotten. Yep. For sure. Smart, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so what, like, I guess from, you know, a company perspective, um, there are a ton of companies out there doing what Alan and company is doing. What do you think, uh, separates you guys from some of the others? What separates us? Um, I've been, I think, I don't even know now. I think I'm up to eight companies in 10 years. I'm a millennial and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the place that I got a nine month old son. Like I'm trying to find the place that work and right. life are a balance and I'm not, you know, sacrificing time with my son just to be at work every day. Um, Allen and company treats their employees as, as human beings with families and things outside of work. Um, that's one of the big ones for me. Um, another one that we, we actively try to hire veterans any chance we get, um, you know, uh, we appreciate that, by the way, and 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 everything you've done, by the way. Yeah, I, absolutely. Don't say, we don't say that enough, but the uh, the veteran community, you know, there's, from my knowledge, there's not surveyors in the armed forces. You know, there might be in some branch. I don't I don't know, but I've never met a surveyor that came just straight from the army and learned all of these tools and techniques. But um, mm -hmm. a lot of the <clears throat> veterans. Per, per, um, inherently have a lot of the soft skills that it requires to be a surveyor you know you need a mm -hmm. long day yep they're 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 familiar with that you need somebody that's going to get the job done they're familiar with mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. somebody yeah. that can communicate at a high level they're pretty good at that you know understanding they take veterans take the time to understand the mission before they go out and any surveyor knows one of the worst things out there is when your guys when the, the crew doesn't really know what they're doing and they go get check shots, they, they, you know, they're out in the field for a week at the same site, they come back and you've got 70% of what you need or the 70% of the picture, you're missing some details. So the, the lack, the, the wanting to understand the mission and how to do it their best and the, the attention to fine details are, are skills that veterans just inherently possess. So we try to hire them any chance we can. Mm. Yeah. You're here. Super cool. That's awesome. What else? You got anything else, Sean? Uh, I do have to share something. And, okay. it's, and it's actually, you guys will, will find this interesting based on our conversation. And uh, this, this came up in our, in our meeting today. And uh, it was, uh, we sent a Christmas card out to our old friend, Connor. Oh yeah, uh, yeah Connor yeah, O'Gorman, COG, COG, uh, and he shot back this uh, this email: um, ten lessons from a thousand deals, and it's just ten basic company lessons. Sure, and I'm just going to go through the the first ten because go for it. It'll be very very on point. Uh, number one: how you do business matters. Build a great culture and attract great people. Mm. Giving back pays off. Uh, the world never ends. Embrace failures. Yep. Innovation wins. Yep. Leadership is vital. Bam. Alignment of interests. Yep. Specialization is critical. <laughs> and love what you do. <laughs> Look at that tie that in crazy? there. Wow. <laughs> I love when that happens. Right? Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. Um, man, oh man, I feel like I could talk to Smart Sean. All night long, you know he 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 may be a better conversation guy than uh, Dumb Sean over here, but no, well, no, not not dumb, just not so smart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sean! All right, so before we let you get out of here, is there anything else you wanna you wanna get out there before uh, before we let you go? Uh, just try to bring some peace and love into the world. You know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of evil, nastiness, hatred. There's a lot of taking things too seriously and and thinking the worst of of each other, or your boss or your colleague, and they did something to try to like it was intentional. They did this because they know it drives you nuts, and you know, just encourage people to try to ask why they're thinking that. You know. Yeah, well said. I mean, did you write well that down? Because that was, of that, course, yeah, I wrote yeah, it. Down. That, that was that was really good. Yeah, of course. Um, anything for you, Sean? Uh, no, no. It's uh, it's refreshing to have a millennial on that uh, kind of is pretty like minded from from myself. If uh, <laughs> I, 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 
I like everything here. Uh, no, 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 uh, I'm good. this oh is all God. good stuff. He spells his name different than you. Don't worry about it. Yeah, you know, we'll take we'll take that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sean, hey, thanks again for your time. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'd love to have you come back sometime. To be honest with you, this has been great. Thank you so much. My ego did not need another boost, but I appreciate it. I'm happy to come back anytime, guys. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. And again, thank you for your service as well. All right. Adding value and making friends. That's what we do here at the Geoholics. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. If anyone would like to be a guest on a future show or you have any ideas for guests or interesting topics, what have you, shoot us an email at info at thegeoholics.com. We'd love to hear from you. Blink 182, all the small things available everywhere, of course. Uh, until next time, everyone, I got some doozies here. Yes. Understand the mission, use the right tool, bring peace and love to the world. Most importantly, be safe and healthy and happy holidays. Happy holidays. Jingle bells. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no.